With the basic concept of impedance introduced, the next most important step to take is to understand the concept of impedance, the phase of impedance. In electrical engineering uh, and physics, these will often be called understanding the phasor diagrams of, of a circuit or any system that you're looking at. So to understand, let's go back and revisit the idea of impedance, where impedance is the complex resistance plus Jx, which is reactance. So resistance plus complex reactance gives us our impedance. You can again think about this as a two-dimensional plot, just like you can of all complex numbers, where this is on the real axis, and this is the imaginary axis up here. And so that means we have some vector out here in space that represents our Z. And we have another term here that is our theta, which is our angle off the axis. And the magnitude is the magnitude of the vector. No problem. We can call that R just if we want. Okay, so very similar to polar, polar notation. The phase of the impedance is the angle that it takes. You can have an impedance that have a common magnitude and you can sit there and rotate it all the way around. So the same magnitude of impedance and what you're doing, well, again, you can't have negative resistance so you can't actually go over here, um, but you can wander anywhere along this space from along the imaginary axis to negative end of the imaginary axis with the same magnitude R for your impedance, right? What you're doing is you're changing, interplaying between the real and the imaginary components. You're, you're switching between resistance that's real and reactance that's imaginary, even though impedance, the magnitude of it is staying the same. What is the fundamental difference? What, what's the point? Right? Why do we care about the phase of the impedance if the thing that primarily determines the resistance, right, the, 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 the amount that current is impeded from flowing is sort of the magnitude of that? Well, the phase, the angle of the impedance, the phase of the impedance actually tells us the degree to which the voltage and the current sinusoids are in or out of phase. That's what impedance is doing. That's what the phase of the impedance is doing. What does that mean? Let's unpack this a bit more. And to do so, we first got to build a chart, a table that breaks down each of the components and tells us what their contributions to impedance are and what they do to this phasor diagram, how they move the vector if you add additional components in series to a given impedance that you have. So let's build this chart. We've got the component here. We've got its contribution to impedance Z here. And we've got the direction it moves the phaser here. And so let's put this down as our chart and let's start with the simple case, the resistor. We all love the resistor because it's so easy to understand. Its contribution to Z is just R, very simple. And which way will it move a phaser? Well, if you add R to an existing, in, if you add a resistor in series to a given impedance circuit, where will the direction of the vector now point? Well, it will point however much the resistance is and it will move along the real axis. It's going to go just right and only right. It isn't going to go up and down because there's no imaginary component to a resistor. As a result, which direction will it move the phaser? It'll move the phaser to the right. What if we have a different component? What if we have an inductor? There's a reason I'm, I'm using inductor first and not capacitor, we'll get there. Its contribution to Z, right, is purely reactive and it's written as J omega L, okay? So if we go up, and 
it. So for some fixed frequency, pick it doesn't matter. If we uh, if we go uh, along the I L, if we go L along the I direction, we're going to go up, purely up. L amount times the frequency that we are at. And so what you'll see is one, the phaser goes up on for an inductor, purely up. And what you'll notice is that the magnitude of that is going to depend on the frequency we're at. So the, the phaser diagram and our impedance itself, well, again, was going to be a function of, of frequency. That's a theme that you should keep in mind. Impedance is not constant. Impedance is a function of frequency. So whatever frequency you're playing with will have an impact on the impedance. Now let's take a look at our capacitor. Our capacitor, its contribution to Z is also purely reactive. It's, it's written down as one over J omega C. C, there we go. Now, which direction does this move the phaser? Well, it's not exactly obvious, is it? I mean, what on earth is a one over J? Let's do some math real quick. One over J, right, is one over I, same thing. This has got to be equal to multiplying by one. And so how about we just decide that we're going to multiply by one by multiplying by J divided by J, just for a moment, because there's nothing wrong with multiplying by one, right? Doesn't change the output of the answer. So that means we get J over J squared. And that is J over, well, what's the square root of negative one squared? Just negative one, which means that we get negative J. Oh, that's pretty cool. So that means this is the same as negative J over omega C. And so now it's very obvious what direction the capacitor pushes the phasor diagram. It moves it down. Absolutely. Because it's moving down in the I axis, in the J axis by one over omega C amount. And so it will pull this down. And so you can figure out the final phase angle of your impedance by simply performing this analysis, adding up all of your components, figuring out how much resistance you have, going right to the real amount that might, and then going up and down depending on what's going on with your inductors and your capacitors to find your final phase of your impedance. This is called a phasor diagram when you make those add, when you add and subtract all those things to come up with your final impedance. And you can do this math in both, you know, the explicit time domain, but you can also do it in the, in the, uh, in either the I, uh, in either the I representation, because it's all the same. Why does this matter? Well, this matters because it affects the relationship between voltage and current, depending on what the angle is. This is where the term Eli the Iceman comes from. Keep this in mind. And we will revisit this statement in a moment to see why it's so useful. Let's say we have a sinusoidal voltage source and we've connected it to a resistor and we're running this just through time with voltage V resistance R, we can calculate the, the current flow, which is just V over R, and that's I. If we were to plot, and this is for some frequency omega, it doesn't matter what the, what the frequency is, it's just some frequency omega. If we were to plot the voltage diagram, we would see that it would start off, we'll actually make it 
center stable, uh, so that's starting at zero, we would see that it would look something like this. And if we did the current in red, now let's do the current in blue. If we did the current in this light blue, then as a fraction of whatever R is, let's say R was relatively large, we're gonna see small current, and so it'll look something like this. Perfectly in phase with our voltage, such that when this hits a peak, this hits a peak. When this hits a peak down, a trough, this also hits a trough. Um, time, if this is time on this axis, these are perfectly aligned. Why? Well, if you look at the phase angle of a purely resistive circuit, it's only sitting on this real axis. There's no, the angle, the theta is zero. The phase of the impedance is zero. When the phase of the impedance is zero, you have alignment, zero shift between the peaks, between the, the phase of the voltage and the phase of the current. That's what the phase of the impedance is telling us. It's what the shift is between our voltage and our current. This is not the case for a capacitor, for example. Now let's look at the example of a capacitor. So again, we've got our voltage source, oscillates, we've got a capacitor, it's got a capacitance C, it's got a voltage V, it's got some thing omega. Now if we write and draw the diagram here, For voltage, I should have probably picked a different color for the axes themselves, right? Let's make it yellow. For the voltage diagram, we're gonna, gonna, gonna get, right, our nice frequency curve. But what's gonna happen to theta? Theta is going to be Right. What, is the re what is the impedance going to be? The impedance is going to be purely reactive and it's going to be capacitive only. So it's going to push this down in the interaction axis only. That means theta is sitting here at negative pi over two or negative 90, depending on what, what units you like to use. What this means is that voltage, the relationship between voltage and current is going to be offset by negative 90 degrees. So what this means is that when the voltage is at a peak here, at pi over two, the current is gonna be negative 90 degrees out of phase of that. What that means is that for this particular example of a pure capacitive system, we draw the, the current, it's gonna start off here. and it's going to be perfectly out of phase. 90 degrees out of phase of, you get the idea. 90 degrees out of phase from the voltage with the same, with whatever amplitude that it is. It doesn't matter what the amplitude here is. The amplitude is, is irrelevant. The key is that the phase shift representation between the two is totally different. Let's see if I can clean that up a bit. Let's actually make it similar to the other one. So we start here at its peak. We're gonna cross zero here. We're gonna have another peak here. We're gonna cross zero here. We have another peak here. Nope. There. So what this is saying is that the current is 90 degrees, negative 90 degrees ahead shifted. You'll notice that current in this case is leading voltage, right? Or in the other, other way around, voltage lags current. And if you think about the operation of a capacitor, that is exactly what happens. The moment you flip this switch on and you're charging current in, 
to charge up the capacitor, you're passing current into the charge of the capacitor, you have much higher current flow for a transient period of time. Why? Because the voltage per drop across the capacitor is very low. And only after charge and current has flown and charge has been built up, does the voltage start to build here. And so current for a capacitor will always lead, will always come first in front of voltage. That's what ICE is. C is for capacitor, and you'll note that I is in front of the E. The E is voltage, the I is current. E leads, uh, the I leads the E. Eli, the ICE man, or me, and the ICE component of it is that the current in a capacitor leads the voltage. That's why the I is in front of the E. And so I've basically given away now this, the secret because we know what happens then in an inductor. In an inductor, it's exactly the opposite. Why? Well, because the behavior of an inductor is exactly different, right? It moves the phasor diagram up instead of down. And so if you take a look at this, and you have some inductance L, some voltage source V, some omega here, and you make your plot where you have V, then sure, we can start off the same and have our sine wave V, but what's gonna happen to our current I, well, what's gonna happen is it's going to be 90 degrees positive shifted, right? Because for an inductor, it's reactance, it's purely reactive, and it pushes the phasor diagram up. So the, the, if you, all you have is this inductor, then you have only a upward facing, purely upward facing uh, phase of impedance. And so that means that when this is peaking, here, this guy is just getting off the ground. It's gonna be here. And when this is here, this guy's peaking. And when it's peaking here, it's back to zero. And it's here, it's peaking. And so over here, it is, what's that, it's gotta got be down here. So it's gonna look something like that if it was an actual sine, sine curve, which I'm bad at drawing apparently. Um, you get the idea. Here, right, the current is lagging in time relative to the voltage. The voltage leads the current. That's why E is in front of I for Eli, well, L is the inductance. If you think about that, that's also the way an inductor works because as a function of frequency, what's going to happen first? Is the current gonna change or the voltage gonna change, right? Remember, inductors like to keep the current flowing exactly where it is. So what has to happen to have anything interesting happen in an inductor is that the voltage drop across this first needs to change. And then slowly as that's being dragged across, the current will follow. That's why it's Eli and voltage leads the, induct uh, the, the current in an inductor. That's what it means to have a positive phase of your impedance. It means that the voltage is in front of your current in terms of phase. If your impedance is negative in angle, right? It's on this corner here, uh, in this quadrant over here, then that means that your current is leading your voltage. That's what the phase of impedance describes. Extremely useful. Now, of course, these are only all for steady state. These, aren't, these don't describe transients, but this is only for steady state representations.